from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Um, I'm a contributing editor of the Washington Post book world, and once again, the Post is very happy to be a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. We were present at the creation 11 years ago, and we've been supporting the festival ever since. I've never read the bylaws of the National Festival, if, if actually they indeed exist, it says, no Drabelle, no Lippmann. This is either the third or fourth time that I've introduced Laura, and uh, we've gone through this ritual so many times that this, after this session is over, we're going to start rehearsing for Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, I'm such an admirer of Laura Lippmann that I would be miffed if any other introducer got the nod instead of me. But I do some, sometimes wonder about the effect of the two most Baltimore-centric creative minds working today on tourism. Seeing the movies of John Waters gives you the impression of Baltimore as a haven for oddballs and disgust. Reading the novels of Laura Lippmann shows you a town riddled with kidnappings and murders. Rather than squawk about this, however, Baltimoreans take pride in her work and her obvious affection for the city as well they should. It will come as no surprise to anyone who reads her fiction that Laura is a local girl, born and raised in Baltimore. She spent a dozen years as a reporter for The Sun, publishing seven Tess Monahan novels while holding down a full-time job at the paper. Tess Monahan, of course, is the private eye who anchors a now illustrious series. Laura has written 18 books in all, for which she has won an Edgar, an Agatha, and a fistful of other awards. Her new novel is The Most Dangerous Thing, which takes place in the off-the-beaten-track West Baltimore neighborhood in which Laura herself grew up. And I can't help throwing out a, a conundrum. Toward the end of the story, Tess Monahan makes an appearance I would say that it's less than a cameo, but probably not enough to qualify for a Best Supporting Actress Oscar if the book were to be filmed. So should The Most Dangerous Thing be classified as a Tess Monahan novel or as a standalone? Please welcome the person best qualified to answer that question, Laura Lippmann. I'm making sure to turn my cell phone off. And I, I'll go ahead, pull it up. How are we, good? Is this good? People can hear? Um, I, and I'll go ahead and answer the question. The most dangerous thing is definitely a standalone. And as Dennis said, it is set in a neighborhood in Baltimore, Dickieville. It's the neighborhood where I grew up. And I had this really poignant conversation with my mother this week who had just finished reading the book and she asked me if I had a happy childhood <laughs> and I felt bad because I had a wonderful childhood I had a lovely childhood um, Dickieville is a place where in many ways I yearned to move back as an adult and it didn't work out that way but I've chosen to set a very dark story and one of the places I love more than any place else on earth. And I, I don't really have an explanation for that beyond sheer perversity. <laughs> someone, someone recently said, a friend recently said sort of of me, you know, I, I, you're a nice person and you write these very dark books. I don't really understand that. And I'm not sure I understand it myself, but I think what happens is I'm a nice person because I have a nice life. I mean, it's really easy to be a happy, jolly person when life is treating you well, and life has treated me exceedingly well, which is basically good luck. So I'm happy for that, and I'm grateful for it. But when I look beyond my own threshold, I see a world in which there's a lot not to be happy about and not to be content about, and that's why I gravitated to crime fiction. I've been doing this since 1997. I've spent a lot of time in front of audiences and talking to readers. And it fascinates me that I know some readers who I bet someone here today had someone tell them this. And maybe even one of the writers here today said this. 
Never, ever ask a writer where they get their ideas. Have people heard this? Okay. Because to me, it's the most logical question in the world to ask. I, it, it makes sense that people would be interested to know where stories come from. And it's something that I like to talk about because I think in part because I do work in a mainstream popular genre, I don't have a lot of literary airs. And especially when it comes to the subject of idea generation, I don't think I deserve a lot of points for having ideas. It's kind of my job. And it's what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I show up and I need to have an idea. I sign contracts that say I'm gonna write books every year. And when it's time to have an idea, I take a really matter-of-fact approach to it. Now, sometimes I've already had the idea for ages. I saw something in the newspaper and I asked the ultimate novelist question, what if, what if, what if, what if? But, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, so the backlog of ideas has really been whittled down. And I'm pretty much starting fresh every year, new book to write, I need a new idea. And I am not the kind of person who's going to tell you, oh, you know, I need to go for long walks in the pouring rain and communicate with my muse. If I waited for my muse, I don't think I would have finished my first novel. I can't wait for inspiration. I go to work, and sometimes inspiration catches up with me. And yes, I have days that are inspired and fun and inventive, but I can't count on having those every day. And this is my job. And I'm pretty sure everyone here has a job and doesn't expect a lot of credit for showing up Monday morning. So why would I expect a lot of credit for having ideas? And as I said, I don't like, I don't like anything that puts the reader down there and the writer up here. I've got no patience for that whatsoever. And a couple years ago, it was the end of the year, it was about the time in which I would need to have an idea. And I went to this event with other writers, and this isn't a very pretty part of the story, but it's a very key part of the story. I felt that one of the other writers snubbed me. She was nice to everybody else but me. Now, it's really important to understand, this could have been totally in my head. I could have made this whole thing up. That's what novelists do, often to their detriment, and I have a funny story I might tell you about that. But at any rate, I'm like, she snubbed me. I don't like her. I mean, I got my, I got my feelings hurt like a little girl. And so I was sitting there in kind of a pout, feeling snubbed, and the writer got up to talk, and this was a room full of people who wanted to write. It's a Saturday morning. They've taken time out of their life, they've spent money to come hear the famous writer explain how to be a writer. And the talk that unfolded, I thought was one of the most worthless things I ever heard in my life. I mean, I really, I mean, and okay, yes, she had snubbed me and I was feeling very pouty about it. <laughs> but even you put aside the fact that I felt personally offended by her, I really thought she had misread her audience. And to give an example to show that, you know, there are writers I think who give a brilliant talk about writing, there's a writer named Ron Carlson who I've seen give a talk in which he explains that if you have even 10 minutes a day, you can write. 10 minutes a day. They have to be a very focused, direct 10 minutes a day, but if you'll give yourself that, turn off all the machines and just write, you can do it. And instead, here are these people, they've paid money, they've taken a Saturday out of their life, they have jobs, they have families, they have commitments, and they're trying to get some practical advice on how to get their book done. And this is what they hear. Try not to write too often in the same place. Like, you're lucky if you have one place to write. <laughs> the idea that you have to be moving around, you're, you to, always try to write when sleep is near. <laughs> I was just furious. I mean, I really felt that these people had been cheated. So I thought, well, it would be very bad form to jump to my feet and say, I disagree with everything you stand for. But I said, 
in a sense, I can prove my own case by deciding right now, right here, I'm going to have the idea for my next novel. I'm going to will it. I was like, you know, make it so, make it so. And I got out a piece of paper and a pen, and I began doing old-fashioned brainstorming. And I just began putting circles on the page about things I found interesting. Because basically, what I do every year is I write a novel about what I find interesting that year. And as I, the circles began filling up, and they were all over the place, and I don't remember, I, I wish I had saved that piece of paper. It kills me that I didn't. But one of the circles, and for those who have read my work, this won't be that surprising, one of the circles read obscure Maryland crimes. Now, I grew up in Baltimore in the 1960s and 70s, in what I call the pre-CNN era. So there were these crimes that were really well known locally that no one else has ever heard of. You know, a lot of people know, obviously, that the book What the Dead Know was based on a very famous missing persons case out of Maryland in 1970s involving the Lyon sisters. The book in the end has nothing to do with the Lyon sisters, but I was clearly inspired by that. So I began thinking and thinking about different crimes that had obsessed me when I was a kid. And I remembered that there was, and I'm very veiled about this because it involves a still living victim of sexual assault, and I'm very proud to say that no one, no one has ever guessed the true inspiration for this particular book. But I began thinking about a serial killer whose modus operandi, if you will, was to kidnap his victims, rape them, and murder them except one time. His penultimate victim, he kept alive after raping. And he then kidnapped one more victim, raped that victim, and killed that victim in front of his penultimate victim. I've known this story most of my life. It was really famous. And for the first time, I asked myself, what's it like to be that person? What's it like to be the person who got to live? Are you thankful? Are you paranoid? Do you have a happy life? How do you heal from that? Do you feel guilt? Do you feel any responsibility? And that's the book that became I'd Know You Anywhere, a book that came out last year. So I give you that story to tell you a little bit about idea generation. So a year later, back to work, time to have an idea again. You know, not feeling sorry for myself, not feeling like it's anything special, it's my job. And at this point, because of my unusual family situation, I'm now living in Baltimore and New Orleans and going back and forth between the two cities. I happen to be in New Orleans, and I do what I do in Baltimore. I go down to the local coffee house, I set up my laptop, and I write. I, I like it there, there are no, I don't take my phone, I'm, it's quiet, I get a lot of work done. Well, it's not actually quiet, but it's the kind of noise that doesn't bother me because I worked in a newspaper for a long time. And for every day for a week, I went to the coffee shop and I was like, have an idea, 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 have an idea. And I wasn't, like I said, I, w I was not the least bit panicky. I didn't feel put upon. I think I was pretty consciously grateful that it's hilarious that I have a job where I sit in a coffee shop in New Orleans like, have an idea, have an idea, have an idea, have an idea. And so I didn't get out the piece of paper. I didn't start brainstorming again. But I did something similar. I, I began thinking there aren't really any new stories. And this, I just came last weekend. I was at the annual conference of mystery writers. It's a big conference that's put on by fans. And I had to moderate a panel sort of of the next generation of rising stars. And we had a very lively discussion about whether there are any new stories. I guess one of the panelists said, novel. The very definition means new. The charge of the novelist is to make it new. Other panelists said, but there are no new stories. There, some, someone said there are only two stories. Um, and the two stories someone has said is, a stranger comes to town or somebody goes on a trip. I think that's kind of silly, because I can think about a lot of stories that are neither of those things. But still, it was this really good, lively discussion. 
And one of the panelists, this really terrific up and coming writer named Dwayne Swarzynski said, you know, I think there are new stories and it's about mingling old stories. And he, he is a really geeky kid. He loved action figures and he said, I was the kid who liked to take my Spider-Man action figure and put him in the trash compactor from Star Wars. Make it new. And you know, it happened that last year when I was trying to come up with the idea for the book, The Most Dangerous Thing, the book that would become The Most Dangerous Thing, there suddenly seemed in pop culture that a lot of people were talking about mashups. And maybe this wasn't new, but it was new to me, a mashup. There's even an episode of Glee about mashups and the idea that you take two things and you put them together. And I was very enamored of this idea. So I'm thinking about mashups and I'm thinking about things that are interesting to me. And the first thing I think about is the opening of Great Expectations. Trust me, I think reviewers could read the most dangerous thing over and over again and none of them is going to compare it to Great Expectations. <laughs> But sitting in that coffee shop in New Orleans, that's what I was thinking about. I was thinking, you know, it's so interesting. A young person, and I almost always write about young people because I find them fascinating, meets someone in this wild and sort of scary environment, and the person turns out to be someone so different from whom they thought the person was. It's like, that's, that's interesting, that's interesting, okay. And then I started thinking about one of the oldest stories in the world, which by the way, is not about a stranger coming to town or people going on a trip. It's a story that's been done by crime writers, YA writers, all sorts of people. It's a story about a group of friends who make a mistake, something bad happens, and they agree the only way to cope with it is to keep it a secret among themselves. And for many, many years, the secret stays. And then one day, a member of the group dies, and the others begin to wonder if it has anything to do with this long-held secret. This is a story that's been done over and over again. And I was like, yeah, I could do that. It's interesting. Um, I've seen good treatments of it. I'm, you know, I'm a confident person. I think I could do well by this. But I, I knew I wasn't done. Now here comes the moment in the story where I no longer know if I'm telling you the truth or not. I don't think it matters. I think this is what happens happened next, but maybe I think this is what happened next because it makes the story so good. But I think what happened next is I was sitting there in the coffee shop and thinking about friends with a secret and a secret that comes back to haunt them. I think someone walked into the coffee shop wearing a striped turtleneck sweater. And why do I think that? Because the next thing I began thinking about, and it's not something I think about very often, was the film Nightmare on Elm Street and Freddy Krueger. <laughs> now, I'm not even that much of a horror film fan. I really like the horror genre, and lately I've been saying, if I think about it, the horror genre is um, really well suited to novels about middle age. <laughs> You'll actually find a character in, in The Most Dangerous Thing sort of echo that thought, which is middle age is a horror novel. You know, people die. We start losing people. Just when you think you sort of got it all settled, bad things happen. Now, Wes Craven, for those of you who don't know, actually started out um, in the Johns Hopkins MFA program in the writing seminar studying creative writing. And while I've never seen all of A Nightmare on Elm Street, I know what the idea is. And it's a pretty interesting idea if you know the whole story. The story is that there's a horrible person, a pedophile, and he's essentially killed by a vigilante mob of parents. He's the janitor at the local school, and the parents rise up and they murder him. So what does he do when he comes back as a monster? Who does he target as his victims? Not the people who killed him, but their children. Whatever Freddy Krueger is, he's a pretty smart monster. And I thought, so what if there are two groups of people with a secret? And one group is these kids 
and they've done something wrong, and the only thing they can see is to cover it up. And the other group is their parents, and they've done something wrong, and the only thing they can see is to go forward with their lives and never talk about it. And what if the gap between the two groups, the inability to communicate, is the actual tragedy of the story? And doesn't that hue to what we know about family life, that often parents and children don't talk about the things they should talk about with really tragic consequences? Maybe not as large as the stakes in the novel that I wrote, but pretty high stakes nevertheless. And with that, I knew I was ready to write the most dangerous thing. Um, in the middle of the day or novel, I became a mom for the first time in my life. I've been a stepmom for a long time. Um, I became a mom, and I was very conscious of the fact that a lot of my friends had said, becoming a parent will change how you write. And I, I, was, I, I was kind of contrary about that advice. I write a lot about young people. And people were saying, oh, you won't be able to write about young people the way you used to. And I thought, no, I will be. I mean, I know bad things happen in my novels, but I write about young people as humans, as people. I don't feel sentimental about childhood, had a childhood. You know, I know what it was like. I don't romanticize it. So I was really adamant that there was no way that becoming a mom would change the way I wrote. And I was right. It didn't change the way I wrote about kids. It really changed the way I wrote about parents. <laughs> Suddenly, I had all the empathy in the world for parents. And it changed this novel, because it happened right in the middle of this novel. It happened right before I began writing the section of the novel that is told from the parents' point of view. And it would be different. And the fact of the matter is, on the one hand, I want to stand before you and argue I'm a novelist, I have an imagination. I'm not going to concede that there's anything I can't imagine because then I concede that on some level I'm a failure at what I've chosen to do for, as my livelihood. But on the other hand, every experience changes me and that's how it should be. So yes, the book is very different as a result of me becoming a parent. What is the most dangerous thing? From where does the book draw its title? Now I'm going to say the cheapest thing a writer can say to an audience. You literally have to read to the last line of the book to find out. <laughs> and when you do, I hope you'll be glad that you made the trip there. Having made the trip here, I feel it's very important that I turn the floor over to you. Um, I have this kind of exalted view of readers. I don't really feel my book exists until it's read. And then I feel that it has as many lives as it has readers. And I think that what readers tell me about my books is as valid as what I would tell you about my books. When I go to my desk every day, the thing I tell myself, because I write crime fiction and I write primarily for people who read crime fiction, although I'm always trying to steal a few people off from the snobbish side who say, oh, I would never read that. I write for really smart people. You know how I said there are no new stories? Well, they're not, there's not an infinite number of stories. And people who read a lot of crime fiction, they've seen it all, they've read it all, they know all the stories, they know the twists, they know the double reverses. So the person I write for every time I sit down is I'm writing a novel for the person who figures out pretty much everything by page 50. And my goal is to keep that person reading the book because they're so interested in the characters, they want to find out what the characters are going to do when they find out everything that the reader has figured out. So knowing how I feel about readers, I hope you'll be bold enough to come up to the microphones now and ask me some questions about my work, Baltimore, whatever's on your mind. Oh good, I was worried we were going to have one of those shy crowds. 
But you know, when I have that, I just start asking myself questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Laura, I really enjoy your work. I like science fiction, and um, yours is very uh, compelling. Um, I, I want to ask about your process. You keep, you've repeated several times here that you have to have an idea. When you get an idea, do you then work from an outline, or is it a more organic process? Can people hear pretty well? Because that was a question about process and whether I work from an outline. This is the most perverse story I know about myself. Uh, three years ago, I was asked to write the serial novella that the New York Times was then doing on a weekly basis in the Sunday Magazine. And they insisted that I outline. I had to give them a very firm outline for the 16 chapters I was going to write. I did. And writing that book was one of the singularly most joyful moments of my life, and yet I've never outlined again. I, and I don't know why. It's like, but you know it made it so much easier, and you still, you know, there, there's a saying that goes around. I've heard it attributed to various writers. Um, I always hear Ian e. Forster, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. So I come from what I call the distant shore school of novel planning. I start almost every novel knowing the one big thing. Usually it's a secret. That's not really true in the book I'm currently working on, but there's one big thing. And that's sort of like the main tent pole around which everything will be organized. And I have to get these characters from where they start to there. But it turns out that you know, as you get closer, things look different. And maybe the river is deep, you know, it's like I'm crossing a body of water. Maybe it's deeper than I thought, maybe I go farther downstream. There were a lot of discoveries along the way. The result of this is I have to write many, many drafts. I would say that I write at least five drafts. I try to just run through the first draft like someone's chasing me with a lighted torch. They're like, ah! And I heard that was advice from Steinbeck. I mean, I've, I've literally had a novel in which a character changed gender midway through the novel. It's like, not a problem, not a problem. That's a second draft issue. I got to keep going. Um, <laughs> like, don't look back. Don't look back. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, you'll turn into a pillar of salt. Just keep going, keep going. And then each draft becomes more detailed, more fine-tuned. I will say that I've never written a novel without a key plot point that did not exist in my original conception of the novel that doesn't seem to be so essential that it's impossible to imagine the novel without it, but it's something that I found probably in a second or third or even fourth draft. Um, you know, for an example, in the book What the Dead Know, I always knew who the Jane Doe was didn't have a clue what had happened to her or why she was doing this or what could possibly explain the choices she had made in her life. And that's something I only began to understand after um, draft after draft after draft. Yeah. Oh. When you write uh, a shorter piece, do you, is the process pretty much Oh, the short same? stories. Short okay, short stories are very different for me. Um, I only write a short story because somebody calls me up or emails me and says, hi, Laura, I just sold a book of short stories where all the short stories have to be about blank. Would you write a story about blank? And I love to do that. I consider it an external prompt. It's like a really good exercise for my imagination. So right now, I owe a short story about something in a box. <laughs> and it can be metaphorical. And that's for a collection that Brad Meltzler is, is editing. And after that, I have to write some kind of spy story. So, I mean, that's just, but I just take the suggestions people give. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, I have a really easy question for you. What are you reading? You talk about readers. What are you reading? What am I reading right now? Um, I've been reading very fitfully. I'm reading the biography of Wendy Wasserstein by Julie Salomon. Um, the, the book I just read, which was terrific, was for research. 
It's a book called Call Girl by a woman who was a teaching assistant in the Boston area who chose to work off her debt by going to work for an escort service while she was teaching full time. And it was really well done. It's a really interesting book. I really enjoyed it. Um, I just read, because I was at VoucherCon and I was prepping myself and I had to make sure I was up to date on all the people I was on panels with, read a really good first novel by a young woman named Hilary Davidson called The Damage Done that picked up two awards last weekend at our convention. Um, I've been trying to read this literary novel that I won't name. <laughs> and it's so bad. And I'm not, I'm not someone who feels like I have to finish stuff. And the thing is that it's the kind of book, the reviews were rhapsodic, by the way, and it's a, certainly a story that is the kind of story that interests me. It's a story not that different from something I might write. And I had this real foot and mouth moment up in New York where I was with a group of people and this one agent said to an editor, what do you think about blah, blah, blah? And I just said, I can't get past page 30. Well, it turned out that that was his client. And so he said something, he said, and not so much to me, he said to the editor, you know, it's amazing, you know, because of the reviews, a lot of people are picking this book up thinking it's very mainstream fiction. It's really a very literary novel. It literally took me five hours to realize that he just said I was really stupid. <laughs> and I was gonna say, I read literary fiction all the time. I'm not stupid, this book just, isn't good, but anyway. Um, so you can see I'm really, uh, I'm also having an enormous amount of fun reading a cookbook. I won't rem remember, is it, I won't remember her name. She writes for the New York Times. It's either like Melissa or Martha, but every recipe has a story. I love to read cookbooks. One of my favorites is um, Sweet Tea and Screen Doors. I might have reverse those, and I also really love a book called Cooking Up a Storm that was sort of almost an anthropological effort to gather old family recipes after Katrina in New Orleans. And um, it's a really great cookbook, so. And I'm probably, I'm probably rereading something that I forgot to mention. I often reread children's books all the time. And um, lately I've been spending a lot of time with the work of Eric Carle, so yeah, yeah. And, and there's a great book called Happy Baby, Sad Baby. <laughs> Thank you, hi. Hi, I'm also a Laura, and I'm also living in the Baltimore area, and I would like to invite you to come to Oella, the sister city of Dickieville. I, I know Oella, um, and I actually used a fictionalized version of Oella, and I'd know you anywhere. The neighborhood where that character grew up is inspired by Oella, but I needed it to be in Baltimore County. I needed a certain amount of freedom with the map, and you know, that's often so, I, I do know of Oella, and I have seen it, I've had friends who live there, so it's beautiful, it's absolutely gorgeous. There are not many houses there, right? Oh yes, there are. There are, but it's like, back. It's, hard, it's hard to like, buy a house there, There's, it's. Well, not right now. Not right now. <laughs> well. So my question is, who are, besides your husband, other Baltimore writers you really like? And, and have you ever met Ann Tyler? <laughs> You're presuming I like my husband? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Kidding. I like, I, um, I have never met Ann Tyler. Um, I am, oh, I'm sorry, the question was about other Baltimore writers I admire. I, I admire Ann Tyler mightily, never met her. I've seen her in public. I've never approached her because it's my understanding she's an extremely private person, so I would not violate that. Um, John Waters is a terrific writer. Uh, his essays, his memoir, I, I bet a lot of people here have not read the piece that inspired all of the versions of Hairspray. He wrote the most straight up affectionate profile of the old Buddy Dean show. It ran in Baltimore Magazine. Um, it's in one of his collections. His new book, Role Models, is fantastic. Um, I admire Madison Smart Bell. I admire Stephen Dixon. I admire Dan Festerman. Um, I'm gonna be in trouble because I'm gonna leave out some terrific Baltimore writer. And one of the Baltimore writers I admire most is my father, Theo Lippmann Jr., 
who for 30 years was an exceptional columnist and editorial writer for the Baltimore Sun. So thank you. Okay. I just wanted to say that I have enjoyed and read every single one of your books, and I enjoy the characters in the maroon. And now I know why Tess was pregnant when you read that book. No, Tess got, Tess, um, Tess had a kid well before I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, Tess. Maybe I missed that. Te well, she, Tess, it. she had, she, that was originally written in 2008, and I did not have a child until 2010. Um, one of the things I never anticipated, I knew that having Tess become a mother would change the series forever. Part of the reason there has not been a new Tess book is because I can't quite figure it out. And I'll be truthful, I'm being a little bit, uh, I'm sort of holding back because right now um, the Tess Monaghan books are at the TNT network. A pilot has been written, I think, as of now. And, you know, I think that also might change the way I write about Tess once she has a television alter ego. So I'm just giving her a rest and I'm trying to figure this out because you know, Tess is my imaginary best friend. I didn't know very much about what I was doing when I started out, but I had the foresight or the accidental luck to create a character that I wanted to spend a lot of time with. Well, I do too. Yeah, I love I Tess. Write more. So uh, to go back to her, I, I have to do it right. And I don't quite have it down yet. Sometimes I think. I should just basically start writing a lot of Tess short stories that predate her life as a single mom. Um, one of my favorite short stories that I ever wrote, a short story that was singled out by Joyce Carol Oates, is called The Shoe Shine Man's Regrets, and that features Tess Monaghan. And then sometimes I think since the Tess books have always been kind of elastic in their timeline, you know, she's only aged, what, like six years and 14 years, that next time we see her, maybe her daughter will be 10 years old and that will be different. I don't know. I, you know, and I, I'm gonna figure it out though. I'll, I'll make that pledge. I will figure out how to bring Tess back, but I'll do it right when I do it. I look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, hi, I'm also an Wild Lake alum. So. Hey, hey. I, I think a few, I'm, I'm guessing a few years behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, a few decades. 1997? Yeah. <laughs> Columbia has appeared in, I'll go with the easy question first. Columbia has appeared in a couple of the books. Um, the book To the Power of Three is set a completely fictional subdivision in Baltimore County. Part of that was I needed it to be Baltimore County, again, because um, I wanted to use this team of detectives I'd always created. And part of it was because I knew I was gonna present it as a fairly soulless and not very attractive place, a place that had a rot at the center of it. And A, I don't think that's true of Columbia. I think, you know, Jim Rouse had a really lovely vision of the community he wanted to create. And B, my stepson lives in Columbia, and I didn't want him to go to school and have people say, oh, your stepmother is the woman who said that Columbia is crummy. <laughs> so, um, and Columbia appears in Butcher's Hill. Um, and it's Howard County is definitely in I'd Know You Anywhere. It's where, um, Eliza ends up going to high school and where her parents settle, I think out near Olney. Um, I always wanted to be a novelist. To me, being a reporter was what I did because it was a writing job where you got a weekly paycheck. My dad was a journalist. I saw that path. I understood it. I didn't know how someone became a novelist. I always wanted to be a novelist. That, I mean, that was the dream. I can't quite believe I did it. And so I was writing fiction always on the side. And the one thing I would say to newspaper editors, the reporters who want to write fiction are actually much clearer about the line between fact and fiction than the reporters who um, just want to sweeten their stories. You know, people would say to me, what, didn't it bother your editors that you were writing fiction? I'm like, no, I mean, because, I, you know, by the way, most of the stuff that reporters have fabricated and gotten into newspapers or magazines would never work as fiction. It relies on 
the idea that real life is stranger than fiction, so they write stuff that if you read it in a novel, you'd go, oh, that's ridiculous. But people were reading it in a newspaper, so they're like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, I will say that reporting is a really good background for would-be novelist. It teaches you to be professional about your work. It teaches you to meet deadlines. Let me tell you something. You know, New York publishing, like everything else in the world, is in turmoil. No one knows the physical future of the book. But they like working with journalists. They like people who are matter of fact and turn their work in on time and don't act like divas. It's a really great background. Um, I think we're going to have time for this one more question. I actually have two questions. Oh, you can ask both, okay. yeah. Sure. I'll st uh, why is my work so grounded in place? It's because what it's what I like to read. I really love to read novels with a strong sense of place. They don't have to be real places. Um, it can be Oz. It can be this incredible fictional Chicago that Scott Turow has created for his work. But I like reading fiction that's about a place, and I always have. I was astonished. One of the most seminal books in my reading life is a book called All My Friends Are Going to Be Strangers by Larry McMurtry. And I read a university press version, and there was an essay at the end which said, this is Larry McMurtry's farewell to regional literature because all mature artists move on past regional literature. And I was like, what? <laughs> okay, <that's not> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't get that. I mean, like, what, like, did Faulkner have, you know, some sort of... Um, so I love place, and I've always read for a keen sense of place, and, I, and I, I'm so respectful of place that I don't try to fake anything in my books. If even the, the, the area of St. Simon's Island in Brunswick appears very briefly in What the Dead Know, why? Well, because my parents, my dad's originally from Brunswick, my parents spend every winter on St. Simon's Island, and I go to visit them, and I knew I could drive around and find the right house. And I, I mean, I had to see it from a stranger's eyes. But I'm really respectful of places. And then this is your last question as we head into overtime. Oh, no. The game's in overtime. <laughs> and, and it may not be a good question. Um, I'm a really big fan of yours, and I'm also a really big fan of your husband. And um, I was wondering how often you collaborate and what effect your work has on each other. Um, I was asking about my, my husband, who's a writer. We have so far not collaborated, although there is a project that we're working on with George Pelicanos that I don't think I'm at liberty to talk about. Let me just say it's not anything you could possibly imagine. And you know, I will say the thing about two writers who live together, there's not a lot of talk about writing. But when you do need to talk about writing, it is great that your partner is someone who actually understands that you can have a bad day sitting on your duff doing nothing. And that can in some ways be the worst day of the week. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.